Hello, welcome. My name is Kara Ripley and I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at the Oregon Public Library. So welcome, glad to see you all here. Uh, tonight we have Steve Banowitz with us who will be talking about uh, native landscapes in an urban environment. Um, for folks who are watching online, if you have any questions, you can email me and I will ask at the end. Um, and then that's, that's all my intro. So <laughs> Steve, I will pass it over to you and you can fully introduce yourself and that's that. Thank you. I'm Steve Banavis. I, I own a, a small company called Field and Stream Restorations in Cottage Grove, Wisconsin. We do all kinds of natural areas restoration work from woodland restoration to savannas to wetlands, woodland, um, and prairies. A lot of the work that we do is stormwater attenuation um, development. So uh, prairies around basins, uh, infiltration, um, plantings, um, vegetated swales, things of that nature. Uh, I, I don't uh, do lectures in a can, so I just let it flow. Uh, that's my best opportunity to convey what I know. So I would ask that if any time you want to ask a question, just raise your hand or get my attention, because the best time to ask that question is when it comes to your head, so you don't forget. I can always figure out how to start back up with what I'm going to do. I'm going to show, uh, have some slides so that you can get an idea of some of the different kinds of projects we've done in urban environments. And um, we kind of get through there. We'll talk about a few more things. Um, and then we'll, we'll, I want to spend the majority of time probably just answering questions and um, uh, fielding small discussions. So, moving on here. This is kind of how I have my slides laid out. Most of them are just simple pictures of project sites from all over Dane County and Waukesha County. Um, we're going to just look at the widest range of things I could find in my collection. Big sites, small sites, sites that worked well, sites that didn't, sites that were simple and easy, sites that were challenging. Um, probably some of the more interesting ones are ones where uh, a natural area was forced into such a weird space on the environment that it didn't work well or in the, in the urban environment. And so we'll talk and stop and talk a little bit more about each of those as we move through because I want you to go away with um, a great ideas and examples of how natural areas can work in urban environments and sometimes how they, we can struggle with trying to force that into certain areas. Um, okay. So in terms of just simple projects that we've done, this one doesn't have the plants in it yet, but this is what I would say is, is a, a, a simple project. Um, We've got stormwater coming off of the roof and maybe off of a courtyard on this one. Um, it's just going to slowly pool in this low, shallow depression. Um, it isn't too close to the building. It isn't too far away from the building. We didn't create horrible slopes to try and make it work. Um, and it, it becomes attractive over time. Here's another one we did this one last summer on the west side of Madison. Um, again, I think this one is fairly small, but super effective in this situation. Um, a, a mowing front yard wouldn't have done anything in a big apartment building like this. Um, far better to, to use the slope and um, that area to, to deal with the storm water. Um, we also do some much larger urbanish um, projects. This one is at Epic, if you recognize all the cranes. That's the new castaway building. We installed uh, 47,000 plugs. Um, this is a basin, a, a stormwater basin here, but there's a whole lake they created right next door to this in front of that building where most of the plugs went. But this would be an example of a fairly large scale um, natu natural areas creation from scratch. Um, this is a new one close by here in Stoughton, Wisconsin. Um, kind of on the north side of town, either side of Highway 51, if you've ever gone in. Um, Stoughton Trailers is building a new corporate office nearby here. This is kind of a conservation neighborhood. An incredible amount of the land base in this neighborhood is, is being devoted to uh, 
This is a big infiltration basin, so this is engineered soil. We'll talk more about that later. We, then we've got some berms separating these different cells that help work with the stormwater. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that right now. So the pond you see to your right is what we call wet pond. And that's generally where the, first, the water first goes. So if it comes off a street and it's hot and it may have some rubber and brake dust in it, it may have some uh, animal waste, it may have some sand from, from winter, probably some salt loads, um, maybe some soil and things that have fallen off vehicles. So it's kind of pretty dirty water as water goes. And so we put it into a wet pond. A wet pond is lined with clay. The intent is that water will never leave that wet pond other than by evaporation. Um, the idea then is when that water, it gets to be too much water there, it will move into the infiltration basin uh, in, in, in certain situations on high rainfall amounts. So rather than it overloading, going into a ditch, right into a creek and gone, this next idea in this treatment train, if you want to call it that, is that we start with it there, we let all those pollutants over time settle out. If in the future the, the, the pond becomes too shallow, we'll go in and clean that pond out. That we'll take a layer of all that material out and dispose of it somewhere and then keep, keep moving forward. Then it moves into the infiltration basin, which is to your left there. This one's two and a half acres. It's the biggest one we've ever done. Um, that has engineered soil and under drains in it. So the, the concept is water can't really purify itself when it's just water sitting in a hole. But when you mix that water with a rich biological community, so here we've got sand and organic material, and then we'll have um, a rich, diverse uh, natural area plant life. Um, when that water streams in there, you have all this rich bacteria that can break down those pollutants. They're living, that bacteria is living on the, what we call the root film. Little, as roots grow, they slough off like dead skin and the bacteria grow on there. there it's the, root, the root channels have oxygen. Um, there's usually some nutrients coming and going. You've got fine root hairs and things in, in the, the root films that they can, they can live off of. And so it's a rich biological community. Then when that storm water moves in there, it can get cleaned up. As that water moves through the soil, it gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, it can go back to the aquifer. If that system gets overwhelmed, then there's under drains and it will start self-draining to usually a grass swale or a roadside ditch, somewhere where it'll slowly then make its way to a creek. Hopefully a lot cleaner than the water would have been in the wet pond. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on that idea? Okay, sometimes I'm gonna go off on these tangents because these pictures spark memories for me. Uh, this, is a, this is one, the building was called Flex. It's out where the theaters used to be by East Town Mall. I can't think of the name of that, the road that goes up where there's some restaurants and car dealerships on the east side of Madison. This is there. A another one that's you know proper position, proper size. There's some big parking lots, big buildings just upslope. Um, this land was a hard slope down to the interstate. It wasn't going to be able to be used for much. You really couldn't put the building any closer anyway because of access from the road. So this, is, this was an example of a really good one. This is what an infiltration basin looks like when you're going to uh, install it with live plants. The last one you saw is two and a half acres got to the scale where it's impractical to put that many plants in. That would be um, two and a half acres would be 100,000 plants. So you're looking at almost a half million dollars to just put those plants in that space. But in smaller ones, and this is getting on the larger side, but in smaller ones, we'll actually um, put a blanket down, we drill holes, and we install plants, and then we irrigate like crazy until they're up and running on their own. <clears throat> and then we have to weed them by hand and so forth. We, we do everything we possibly can not to use herbicides to control weeds in these, because this is your direct link to uh, the aquifer. This is where the water is expected to drain all the way down through the soil and back to earth. So was there a wet pond there too? There was. Uh, let me, I can go back. I don't know if it shows in the picture. Just on the other side of this berm is where the big wet pond is. Okay. 
and then it connects over. I think, I, 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 uh, with small exception, almost every infiltration basin has a wet pond. I will show you a picture of one that did not. Um, and I don't design these from scratch, so I don't know the criteria of where we go on that continuum of, of the treatment train. This is one um, that's on Irish Lane near the greenhouses on Irish Lane in Fitchburg. Um, you can see that, that there's actually a wet pond built into this one right there. And when that creeps up the bank, then we, we hit more of the infiltration aspect of this one. This one was only taking water from yet another wet pond on a park here because that wet pond was overloaded all the time and starting to get into people's yards. So this was the solution to start to relieve some of that. Um, this one we're going to talk about again because it was an, a unique challenge that we want to talk about. So these are, these are uh, natural areas put into urban landscapes that I think were done well, positioned well, sized well, and have worked well. Now we'll look at a couple that um, I don't want to be critical, but maybe I struggle with understanding how and why. This is a, roads, a, ro a road median. In, in, in trying to maintain natural areas, maybe one of the hardest portions of it is the edge. So as you can see here, we got a lot of edge and very little volume, because the edge is where all your invasives are trying to keep coming in from the outside. They rarely can jump to the center and create a problem from the center out. So the challenges we have here, we've got all this edge effect. So we've got lawn grass constantly trying to invade in. We've got salt being dumped on it all winter long and snow pile on it. So then there's, it shortens up your season a little bit. It's maybe wetter than it normally would, would hope to be. Then you've got um, the wind from vehicles going back and forth creates yet another challenge in terms of pollinators and and butterflies trying to use it, right? So we created, we're trying to create habitat in kind of an in his, in his, I'm gonna struggle with that word, inhospitable location on our landscape. And we're finding that it takes a tremendous amount of effort to try and maintain this compared to the similar square footage in a square block off to the side of a building or in the backyard of somebody's home. This is one that, uh, this one is in McFarland. There's five gardens on this, project, on this apartment site. And I think when you redevelop uh, the urban environment, maybe sometimes we can do a component of natural area restoration. And maybe some sites, it just isn't gonna work. And this is one where it just isn't gonna work. The entire size of this infiltration basin is right there. So we have to mow around it. It has to be maintained for 12 plants. And so, and, and, and there's, there's five gardens like this. This is the smallest, because that's why I took the picture of it. But there's, um, and there'll be one more. Uh, there's five gardens on this eight plex. I think there's eight units, apartment building adjacent to this. And there's so little space left that all the slopes are super hard, they won't vegetate, you can't mow them because the mowers slip and fall down in. They grind it all out trying to get back out. Um, and you can see the poor quality turf all the way around. So this is one where we're, we're trying to cram a great idea into a space that just shouldn't be. Oh, I must have missed, I had another picture. The whole backyard of this apartment building they put into another rain garden. It's only four feet wide and the whole length of the building, but it, it's under black walnut and honey locust trees. And the trees arc all the way to the roof and the trees are on the neighbor's property because there's only 12 feet behind the building to the, to the big solid picket fence that they had to put up to shield this from the, from the neighbor's property. So again, you look at that and you're like, we're on the north side of the building, so there's no sunlight. Then there's tree branches going over the entire area, so there's no sunlight. And then to the north of this, there's a, a, an eight foot high solid fence, so there's no airflow, there, there's no connectivity to anything else. And of course, it, it never is vegetated. It's just bare nothing. Um, and that's a struggle for us. I got a couple here 
This is an interesting site um, uh, up on uh, near Cherokee Marsh uh, on the river um, going into Lake Mendota. Um, this community wanted to redo the riprap and, and when you want to redo your shoreline oftentimes the DNR and Dean County will have conditions that they set. They want you to create a natural habitat as well as protecting your shoreline from disappearing they want a natural habitat so if you're going to make changes they they ask you to kind of come to current standards and um, they had an approved plan they put in the riprap and then someone in the organization in the homeowners organization decided that rather than putting in all the native plants and creating a really nice natural buffer they just do it in pea gravel so that you can see the water and then it's clean and there's no bugs and all the whatever went into that decision. So sadly, they create a very sterile landscape. This is another client that we have. They have several basins like this. And again, uh, you, we walk around to do my stormwater reports and there's no frogs, right? There's no fish, there's no ducks, there's nothing, it's just this. And um, some people love this look because it's very human managed, but it doesn't make very good habitat. I'm going to go back to the first site. This got converted into this. So we um, pulled all the rocks out because they got, they got, I just caught some mean word. Uh, it was noticed that they didn't follow the plan that they were scheduled to do. And so then there became an enforcement action. Um, and so we pulled all the rock out. We put in live plants. It's, I think it's 900 feet of shoreline we did this too. This is a, just a small section that narrows up and goes around the bend. But you look, at, you look at how rich and diverse that plant community is compared to the rocks, and you can understand why the DNR and other people who are interested in lakeshore um, restoration like to see this happen in this, this case. Some of the residents have bothered me because they want to be able to see the water better and they don't like this and then they think it's just all a bunch of weeds. And all I can do is assure them that it, it isn't and that all you have to do is walk out on a dock if you want to see the water or go to the second story of the building. I, 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 can't, I can't make a plant community that's four inches tall, it, it doesn't, really exist in a large scale in Wisconsin. Um, a simple project, I, I said there was going to be a project where there was no wet basin connected to the infiltration basin. And this is it. This is a new substation in, we did this in Mount Horeb, uh, kind of off on the west side of town. And um, I think the reason they don't have to have a wet basin is because other than a catastrophic problem with something on the electrical substation, the only water that's going to show up here is what trickles through the gravel pad. And they, they, they probably don't feel that there's, after the initial burst of the first couple rains, sediment's going to be really reduced. There's, you're not going to have large quantities of rubber, brake dust, and oil dripping off of vehicles and things that would normally show up off of a street. Um, or a parking lot. So this is a pretty simple one. We did this one just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this was a neat site. Again, just real simple on the landscape. Um, this is a renewable natural gas generation facility where they take um, cow waste and they put it in huge vats and with bacteria um, broth and they create natural gas, methane gas, they take and collect that, they compartmentalize it into a real tight, compressed mobile unit. They take it to the landfill uh, east of Madison and they burn it through their electrical generation system there. They, they were able to create their own electricity right on site and feed it directly back to the farms that are feeding this. But the, as I understand it, like landfill gas, it's, it's dirty. And I, I'm not a scientist in that area, so I don't know what dirty means. I would assume it's other volatile organic things are mixed with it, and it, it's really hard to burn it clean and efficiently and create electricity because it, it gums up the, 
I believe the injector's really bad. But Alliant Energy is on the forefront of creating new technologies to, to deal with that. So the, the technology at this site, um, what, they weren't able to um, continue on burning on the site, so they have to take it to a, a more advanced site where they can burn. Um, but we did five gardens like this. Um, it's a, this is a good example of um, when you redevelop the landscape and they, that you're asked to do these kinds of projects, these were already here, but nobody managed them. So they were, um, you can imagine with an influx of rainwater and high nutrient manure that drips off of trucks all day long as these trucks are coming and dropping off their loads, that, that there's a high nutrient load. And so what you're gonna find is invasive species that can grow so fast and utilize those nutrients so quickly, they're gonna overwhelm the native plants that were there. So we dug these out. We put all new engineered soil in. Again, that's sand and compost. We uh, put new blanket down and put all new plants in. And we're vigilantly um, weeding those to try and keep them as clean as long as possible. The other we're working with, um, the, the plant with, is to make sure they continue to mow around them because if you don't, you're gonna encourage that invasive species to move in. Um, I had another interesting point. Oh, some of these basins are actually covered in a fine layer of the organic material, the fiber within um, the um, cow waste that comes and goes. If I think of it, I'll come back to it. I had another thought on these gardens, but I, I lost my thought. So when you say visually feeding, is that like a daily occurrence, or how fast, how much do you have to get out there? What, four times a season. And that reminds me of what I was going to say. When, when we get delivery of engineered soil, it's really important for us, as we're, we're learning, to know the source of the compost. If any of you are experts in compost, you know that to be good compost, it has to get to a certain temperature for a certain length of time, just like cooking food to, to kill all the bad organisms um, and, the, and the bad weed seeds. The load of compost that came with this was filled with weed seed. It, it, after the first irrigation, it was just solid weed. So I had, as a business person, I had set up $800 in labor to weed these gardens. My first weeding cost me $4,000. So I, I, you know, I said, it was $3,200 in two days. And so it's, it's hard, right? And you work very, very hard, and you have these expectations, and that happens. We weeded them one more time late last fall. We went in this spring, and within a couple hours, we had them reweeded. So that's within reasonable, with a, a large staff of people. We, we did them within a couple hours. So I'm hoping that first flush is done because my next opportunity is to either, I have to, I have to jump on this moral decision. Do I start using chemicals to control weed growth or do I lose $3,200 several times a year? And I don't wanna make either of those decisions. So the best is if we just, the weeds just go away on their own that the, the initial flush is done, and now we've stabilized it, and the native plants, we weeded these a week and a half ago, the, the way native plants are already waist high. We took all the weeds out, so hopefully they'll take and double in size before another plant can germinate. The herbicide that we would use is what we would call a pre-emergence herbicide. It attacks, like, preen is the one that you would find in a store. It attacks the first root that comes out of the little seed that's just first germinating. So used properly, you could put it on a garden like this and it's not gonna affect most of the plants in a harsh way enough to kill them, but it, it, some plants will be hurt, some plants will be set back a little bit, but you won't have any or little or no weeds. And so that in theory, you could save myself $3,200, but I have to remind myself it's an infiltration basin for a reason, and I'd prefer not to. Here, let's look at some complex sites. This one was pretty challenging. This was a creek in Waukesha County. Um, 
because of development upstream and the fact that there was a set of culverts right here, that when, that, when it got really rolling with a lot of rain, the, the culverts take the water and they narrow it down and then they shoot it. And when they'd shoot it, it would end up hitting right here and it was starting to undermine this tree in this neighbor's front yard. Um, you can't see in this picture, but there's a fairly large floodplain out here, and you can see where the, the, this is slowly, and that's what rivers and creeks do, right? They slowly make bigger and big, bigger meanders, and then eventually they will cut through and straighten themselves out for a while. It's how they um, move moves, um, sedimentation around, this deposition and movement. Street, so if you look at a natural stream, they're always real windy. And then we come along as humans and make them straight, and then they create other problems. Uh, they're poor habitat. So we didn't really want to stop this from happening, but they also were starting to worry about the fact that we're, they're starting to get closer to closer all the time to their, to their foundation. That the issue of the Lake District came to me in the lake downstream, and they were trying to find sources of sediment that were showing up in their super clean water lake. And as they walk this creek, which is the source of water for the lake, in addition to probably some springs, they saw this as a huge piles of soil just falling off this bank into the water. So we used some, these are scour stop panels. And so we, we put those in, we backfilled behind the, because if you could, you could lay down underneath all of this, that, that it was three feet back from the edge of the water was already gone and this bank just hanging ready to fall. And then we put a neat thing called a wing dam in, which is what you see there. So the idea is that most normal flows is that current comes instead of slamming into the bank, it just slowly breaks it apart and kind of sends it, keeps it in the center of the stream a little bit better. And then we seeded that, put plants into it, and then put a blanket and, and, and uh, irrigated it. If I made a mistake, it was, I, I was asking to be able to trim this tree back so we could get more sun, and they didn't want it trimmed, and then they saw that it wasn't going to work, and so then they let me trim it, so um, it's all good today. Um, this project site, we, we looked at this once before, we're going to look at it again. So here's what happened to make this geese were in it right away, so there's all the stream. project, I think, 2022. And right, right after we installed this, we came back and you couldn't see anything. It was all underwater. We're like, oh, this is bad because you, you, can't, you can't establish plants underneath six feet of water. So we were uh, given additional funding. We got a six inch pump and six inch pipe that we had to run over a quarter mile down the, the um, Irish lane. I think we pumped six million gallons of water in three days. <laughs> so we had to pump this down, and then we had to pump the pond, the wet pond that's just on the other side of it for another day and a half or two. Yeah, it was a lot of water. Um, so that's what makes some of these sites really challenging. So if you see a failed one, it, it isn't for lack of effort. Sometimes things just happen, like geese moving in, and they'll, they'll pull every one of these plants out and wreck it instantly. So with geese, you want two lines, generally. If you have one, they'll either go under or go over. Two, for whatever reason, that they're, they're perplexed. And then we, you can see, maybe you can see us where we ran all the way across. Because if you give them a glide slope to get in, they'll land in the water and take back off. So if you put just a couple wires across, as they come in, they realize that they can't get between them or they're worried. And imagine a bird. The worst thing you can do is break your break your wing or tear a wing apart. So they're, they're innately scared of that. The other way to keep geese out is to have natural vegetation all the way around the pond, which this has now, um, because that's where geese's predators will sit and hide. So if they can't move between land and water, they're much less likely to use it long term. They may still migrate and and visit and poke around, but it, but for long term resident geese year round, if you can stop that land water connection, they'll generally find somewhere else to, um, 
to um, live. Here is a challenging one I did uh, the last couple of weeks. There was a large stone um, retainer wall here. And the problem with hardscape like that is that when you push hydrology pressures behind it, 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 it just keeps moving them until they just fall over. Um, there are ways you can do them well if you back drain them with gravel and pipes and you make sure that any hydraulic pressure that shows up gets dissipated and pushed around. This one didn't have that. Um, but we did it in, in what they call Envirolock bags, which are compost and sand filled bags. And we stacked those up and they're spiked together. And then um, you can see that we made pillows of, of soil with blanket. And then we put native seed and uh, soil in those pillows. And then this will vegetate. I should, a, a current picture would show this all green. So the neat thing about a bioengineered living uh, wall like this is that its weakest day is the day you install it. And as all those roots penetrate those bags, it locks it all together to the point where it really can't move. Conversely, when you build a concrete type wall, its, it's strongest day is the first day you built it. And every day thereafter, nature's trying to figure out a way to push it to the ground and get rid of it. So um, I did another one just like this on this same condo association in Fitchburg that was 400 feet long, but only about four feet high. And uh, it's fully vegetated. Most people have no idea that it's there. And we replaced uh, a wood six by six wall. And this particular site, they moved all the stormwater into rock chases, rock gardens. And this one had a rock garden just on the other side of this one, the white truck. And, and we think it was flowing underneath the retainer wall that was up there, underneath the path, and it blew all of this out. Uh, last year, even though it was a dry year, it blew out last year. So we installed this. It's fairly challenging. We hauled 580 pound bags, had to be hand lifted and put down this wall in, to, to build this. And then to try and figure out how to vegetate it because it's so steep. Um, this was on West Wilson in downtown Madison. We did, I think this was the second story. We also did the very top roof. Um, any area that wasn't needed for patios for people's um, apartments uh, in the pool and some other amenities. They had a dog park on the top roof too, uh, a dog area to let them run around and do what dogs do. Um, so this was challenging because we, we're, we had to be very careful that people didn't fall off the edge of the roof. As you can see how close the next building is, and you wonder, how did we get this huge rack of plants <laughs> here? That had to get pulled from the other side of the building, put in a crane all the way up 11 stories, well, 12, 13 stories in the air, over the building. And then with radios, we had to guide them because the, the crane operator's on the ground, right? So they could pick it up on the ground. They could take it to the point where they could see it. And then all of a sudden, it disappears with the crane. And uh, so we had to use communication to get that, these crates all the way down all the way on the other side of the building. But this was a challenge just because trying, all the other trades persons were working, so trying to get access to the roof, trying to get our materials to the roof, um, trying to water, trying to make sure that everybody stayed on their knees if they were beyond these little gates. Because if you're standing, you can see from the guy kneeling in the orange that you, you just got dizzy or you forgot where you were you would fall off. They wanted us strapped on, but it's impractical to try and go and get plants and it, it, all that with cables attached to you. So we just chose to crawl instead. Um, this is one, we're going to look at a couple failures, just a couple examples. This is supposed to be, this is near Blackhawk Country Club. And again, I'm not being critical of anybody. I'm just using failure as like a, boy, it would have been neat if we could have, but it, it didn't turn out that way. And all the interests involved, this was supposed to be a big prairie corridor. And you go thinking about, this would be pretty, a pretty sizable prairie corridor in this area. It's connected to woodlands, uh, uh, parks, a golf course. It might have been the perfect place to actually put a prairie in. But 
somebody decided they wanted it to be mowing grass right to the railroad. So I, I kind of put it in as my failure. So though we do natural areas restoration, we ended up putting lawn seed down, which sometimes happens. Um, but I thought this was a great opportunity for a huge connected habitat to be put on the landscape. This is one um, by nobody's fault, um, the hydrology um, and the engineered soil failed on this one. There are scientists who design this, hydrology scientists, engineers, who design these so that they should function in a certain way, like this, we call this treatment train, like keep going downhill with, with different ideas to, to make water cleaner and cleaner. So there's a big wet pond sitting right out here that when it overflows, it goes over this berm that, that Jared's standing next to and goes into this infiltration basin. It's been underwater since shortly after it was built. So we put plants in and it got overwhelmed and they all died with, and we thought, okay, it's just a freak. Rainstorm flooded us, drained it down, put all another 1,800 plants or whatever it was in there. And then the water came right back up again and killed them again. And so after that, the, the client just said, I, you know, Where's our reason? Yeah, we're done. We, we don't want to keep doing this. And I, I didn't blame them. Um, so sometimes, and it's, I don't know that it's anybody's fault, when you redevelop a huge site, sometimes the hydrology, hydrology can change a bit. And so um, un, unintended consequences like this can happen where your infiltration basin is underwater now. And the one in the front yard of the building is the same way. Um, so this winter, we cut all the cattails down. Um, we've come back and we've whipped them all, and we're going to try one more time because there are teeth in, the, in, the, in this kind of request that it does have to perform. And so we don't have the hydrology to make it work, so I've got to go with a different set of native species, but Dane County still expects this to be native species, and it's solid monoculture cattail. This is another failure of engineered soil, and you ask yourself, where did all these cattails come from? I mean, this is brand new soil on a brand new landscape that's surrounded by, at this time, mowing prairie. I mean, where's all the, and it was perfect even age stand. It came into the compost. So somebody who's selling compost into this world is going out and digging a cattail marsh, right? Composting it for a while, not enough, and then mixing it in with sand and selling it as engineered soil. And we've seen this a number of times, especially in, I've had two of them in Fitchburg that immediately turned into this. Now we're going to look at a great one. This is where I did the um, retainer wall. This is um, a condo association, Fitchburg on Lacey Road. I started on this project in 2008 or 9, and I've been there ever since. So usually when I have a client, I get them for life, which is kind of nice. Um, this is an example of everything working out perfect. Um, with lots of corrections in, in, in the intern. Um, when we first planted it, uh, instantly the geese moved in and they had mown the entire prairie and the cover crop, nurse crop, down to the plastic netting. And I show up, oh boy, this is gonna be a problem. Because it'll, it'll turn into whatever weeds that geese don't like to eat. It'll be Kentucky bluegrass and reed canary grass and smooth brome. So we started using a deterrent spray. It's, um, I use one called Deer Off. There's, other, there's a whole bunch of different ones you can use. It's all organic, which is nice. Horrible smelling, which is unpleasant. It's putrefied eggs, and usually some kind of garlic oil, maybe some kind of spearmint oil. And I can tell you that when you start spraying it around the pond, as soon as you're upwind of the geese, they instantly, it, it is really bothersome to them. They will instantly, the whole flock will take off. Um, I did a small rain guard uh, when I used to live on the east side of Madison with two guys that now live in Stoughton here. And the, the deer and rabbits would mold the rain garden to stubble and we put this deer off on and that nothing touched it. The, the animals learn very quickly. It is so bad, so foul that they won't come back. So this site turned out really, really well. I got a couple pictures of it. So this, it, um, I can tell you spraying it isn't horrible. It, it's not pleasant, but it's not retching. I can tell you that when you put your backpack on the tailgate and you lean against the sprayer nozzle and it goes right in your mouth, oh, it's retching. 
Um, yeah, I have often had it last several months. Some of that might be envir environmental based. You might be able to find one that's got kind of a, a wax that's kind of a liquid at room temperature, but when it dehydrates, it's, you'll see a little white film on the leaf. We've used a bunch of different ones. Um, but generally, I find that, that um, once you spray, the animals just instinctively go, yeah, I'm never going back there ever again. And they just tend to leave it alone. And so it becomes a learned behavior that something's horrible there. Not to say that you couldn't spray twice a year, or if you had really bad deer problems, you might have to go three times a year, you might have to do it every year. Um, when starving animals get hungry, they're gonna do what they need to do. Um, I think the frustrating thing with, with herbivores is they're, they're um, eating pattern is to try lots of different things. And when you have a yard with just three hostas and they try them, they've wrecked them. Or when they try your tomatoes, the only three red ones you have and they're gone, you get frustrated as a human. Or eat a third of a head of lettuce and walk away. But herbivores are, are way more acute to what their body needs. And so they're gonna pick, 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 and then sometimes they'll eat something and they go, oh, this, this is what I need. And then they'll mow that down more. So that's what herbivores do, they, right? They move through the landscape trying everything. And if they find something they really like, they'll, they'll utilize that resource a, little, resource a little heavier and then move on again. So you, animals like that will wanna keep coming back. You know? So you have to kind of keep teasing them away. So what this is just, we do a natural areas burning. That could be a whole other topic in itself in terms of how to burn in an urban environment. We did a couple hundred acres for Ducks Unlimited, central Wisconsin, middle of the nowheres. Um, this is so nice because smoke isn't an issue, but smoke can be a really big issue when you're burning next to Cabela's on 151 in Sun Prairie, and you realize that we can't take it into this building and anything from the west or north is gonna be in, in, on the Highway 151, um, and it really limits the number of days that you can burn. Um, we've, been, we've burned uh, roundabout circles and had people stop on the roundabout and make a phone call to the fire department. What are you doing? You know, we got signs out, we got little fancy uniforms, we got trucks with all the lights going. It's like, we don't need you to make this phone call. <laughs> you know, I think we're perfectly capable of managing this. Um, those are the challenges that you have in an urban environment. Then the fire department comes and they have to ask us, are you under control? And we're like, what do you like? Because um, usually we have better extinguishing equipment than they have. Not in terms of big, huge pumper trucks, but we have brush trucks, trucks with mobile equipment. We can drive all kinds of neat places. So it gets frustrating, but smoke is a challenge. And usually we can overcome that with just notifying neighbors ahead of time. And we ask that you don't, leave, you don't go to work in the spring with your windows wide open because if we need to come on that day and burn, your house is gonna smell like smoke if you're right there. Uh, but you know, compared to 25 or 30 years ago when I started burning in Madison where it was an absolute disaster every time, people were clogging the roads, the fire department police are all showing up, um, you're getting calls from 911 constantly that you, you've overloaded our system, you can't burn anymore that we can't handle the, the call volume. Um, today, we don't, we don't see that, so it's nice. We get an odd person here and there that feels like somehow we're, we're being criminals doing this somehow, but um, that, that, that's less and less all the time. A lot of people will come out and uh, watch and praise us, so it's kind of fun. This is that same site just in the fall. It's just a beautiful place. Um, and the residents there just love it. So let's just talk about some of the positive and negatives because I want to leave some time. I, I talked and talked and talked. Um, the positives are we, if we start creating enough of these like here and there's a conservancy around us, we start connecting larger and larger spaces, makes better and better habitat. Little tiny fragments don't help a lot, but connected, connected habitat does. Think about a butterfly you know, hitting endless parking lots and rooftops and, and say, uh, I can't go there anymore. Um, in long term, less maintenance. Um, you look at some of the older prairies, like the ones that the, pit, the last pictures I showed you. We'll walk around, take a couple woody plants out. 
We'll control a few of the cattails by cutting them and painting the ends of the cattails. Um, there'll always be a can of goldenrod or a can of thistle somewhere that we'll want to remove so it doesn't get out of hand. Um, but compared to going in every week and mowing that for 30 years, I mean, imagine the effort involved in that, especially on these hard slopes. There's certainly much greater wildlife value. We, we saw that in the rocks versus, you know, uh, lakeshore restoration. Um, we're doing a lot more of the stormwater attenuation, the idea of just piping it to a ditch and letting the ditch flow to a river somewhere and the water's gone. That day is, at least in this region, is, is over with. Um, and you have a landscape that values botanical skills versus sitting on a mower with a headset. You've all seen the, the riding lawnmower with someone with a headset. Now you're hiring people like myself who have taken decades to learn botanical skills and to go out and figure out how are we gonna make this landscape work? What are we gonna do? What techniques do we need to involve? So it's, it's like taking the robot and replacing a simple job with someone who has to work on a computer and, and, and work with the robot electronically. And you know, it's a, it's a higher level skilled job. The negatives, it, it can sometimes attract and, and concentrate wildlife. I got a horrible mouse infestation in my yard because I, 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 I did a lot less than the last owner. I put more gardens in, made more habitat, and I, I'm having to deal with that now because now they've moved into my vegetable garden and they've destroyed my vegetable garden this year. Um, to the point where they're crawling up my broccoli and cutting the leaves off, chewing the leaves off, dropping them and dragging them into a hole. I mean, that's some effort for a mouse. Um, it's frustrating. Um, burning is a great tool. It can be difficult in an urban environment because of smoke management. Um, you can't burn near hospitals, uh, any, any big building that has air, large air intakes without coordinating. It takes a lot more effort that way. Um, we generally have much higher nutrient loads than, than think about being in central Wisconsin in a sandy old area where you try and restore there versus here. You got rich soils that were farmed for years. They have high nutrient loads still in them. Um, that encourages invasive species that can utilize those resources much quicker than the natives can. Um, you have smaller spaces to work in, which is hard. Um, and it requires, uh, my staff requires a lot of skill. And it's hard to find those people coming out of college or out of high school that know 400 species of native plants. So it's, there's a long teaching curve uh, with my staff. In the future, um, I think that urban planning now is getting much better. Like as soon as this building, the concept was, was created, it was immediately what, what can we, how can we tie in with the natural environment around it? And you're going to see um, that rather than being on a parcel by parcel, we're going to start looking at it as whole neighborhoods joining and linking together like we do with bike trails. You see how they, they, design, they, they design a neighbor and they're like, we're already going to put in the bike trails because we know we want the bike trail to go that way and that way as well is connecting with the trail coming from the south. So I think you're going to see more and more of this so that we can connect quality habitat. I think it's going to be, continue to move forward that way. Um, I have a bunch more slides, but they were to address specific questions if you have them. So this is kind of my last slide. What is the, you said 400 different plants that you guys tend to use? I can't put all those, but I, I need to know them because we work in woodlands in central Wisconsin and northern Wisconsin and in Waukesha. So what do you usually use predominantly then in some we of We use places? the ones that work really, really well. So it'll vary from site to site. Yeah, so in, in infiltration basins, I'm interested in uh, plants that have a wide depth of whether they're flooded or whether they're dry, they can be there. Big blue stem's a great example of one. Um, Sweet black-eyed Susan. There's a, I have a whole list that I order from when I order plants for them. I also like big, tall, statured plants because most of these are lower in the landscape. The, most clients don't want anything to do. You know, they're biotech firm. They're, they tell he's making me do this. So putting in little tiny cardinal flowers and little, little uh, flocks, they're, they're never going to become big plants that take up a lot of space and, and crowd out the weeds. So you're just asking for a horrible, maintenance nightmare if you're going to play that. And I've done some schools, I think I did some up in Sauk, Sauk Prairie, um, where they did little monocultures of different 
native wildflowers like cardinal flower. Some of those are a little transitional. Like you, when you find cardinal flowers on flood zones and islands in the Wisconsin River and the Apple River and, you know, and along the Mississippi, they come and go kind of quickly. They're not a long-lived plant. So when you do this corner of the infiltration garden in cardinal flower, and two years later you come back and there's 10 of the 400 left, like that was poorly, poorly thought out. If the concept is neat, oh, burst of red, a burst of purple, a burst of this, and a burst of that, but you have to know the plant better if you're gonna do that. So I tend not to design like that. I tend to find plants, if, if the client doesn't really have a, a set idea, they, they want this, I don't want to mess with it, I, I just want it to work, I want Dane County to sign off on it, I get plants that are this big, this big around, and I put them in one foot on center, or one foot, one plant every two feet, and by the time they're done fighting it all out, it's a solid mass of native plants where there's no space for native non-natives to work their way in. And if we have to go in and adjust, it's you know an odd ragweed here or there that we have to pull out rather than just a carpet of weeds. Did that help you? Yeah, and then, I'm just wondering what that list is, because I would love to have some of those in my yard to uh, fight out the weeds. So. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have a, a special list for infiltration basins, which may be a little bit wetter than your average yard. But if you look for plants that are um, taller stature and can handle your soil and sun levels, those are the ones that, that you'll want to focus you on. You really pack them in. I, 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 Dave Kelly is one foot on center. And that's oftentimes almost impractical when you're, you're, you're stepping on plants and trying to drill holes on top of holes. Um, we do the best we can to get to that. Um, and how do you get to them to weed that ragweed in the middle of You just got to walk all over it and just jump your way in. The, the one foot on center, sadly, was a concept I came up with many, 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 many years ago when we talked about doing rain gardens like this in people's downspouts. And when you're talking about little blazing stars and little nodding onions, right? One foot on center works really well because that's all the bigger they're ever going to get. But that concept when I started promoting it got put into huge basins where we use really, really big plants because it's not it's not overwhelming your yard in that that case. And the whole one foot on center is very true. Cool. <laughs> and I don't know where to go and how to stop that. So we use our best judgment when we do our garden. But yes, tall, robust plants. Now I do have a list um, developed of plants that you never want to use in small spaces because um, if, if you see a catalog, like Prairie Moon is a good example, a really nice catalog that has really good explanations and sometimes they'll have a little note off way off to the right that'll say rhizominous or spreads rapidly or very aggressive. Those are things that you don't want to use in small spaces. My a great example, I did a lot of the gardens at the World Dairy Center 30 years ago. Physostesia, um, obedient plant it's often called. It will root like crazy underground. And so I had parking lot items and all this diversity and they look beautiful. And, and two years later, it's been Physostesia all the way up. I mean, it'll just, it'll just everything else is fine. So, No, because it's, it's only affecting the little seeds. So how do you get rid of that without just spending the rest of your life and pay for that? Then the problem with rhizomatous rooting systems and, and other vegetative ways of reproducing, whether it's above ground or below ground, is that as you break those up, those roots up, you create more plants. So one of the ones we have a hard time with is Japanese knotweed. And I don't know what big, some type of people call it bamboo. You'll see patches of it on the roadside that are just huge compared to anything else growing with it. It's really hard to kill. And even with herbicides, if just a one gram of that root doesn't get killed, it creates another plant. I worked on a, a power line substation where there was a home there and they were making it into a substation. And they dug the whole basement and all the way around the house out, and they sent it to a special landfill because of the Japanese knotweed root. And we got there, and there was little bits of root had fallen on the underneath the basement concrete, you know, where they tore the concrete out. Little bit, and there was Japanese knotweed everywhere. And you know, like, 
they dug the whole thing out with a backhoe, and it was still Japanese knotweed everywhere. And it's, it's a really hard plant. So I don't want to advocate using chemicals everywhere, anywhere, any place. But there are, there are some things that, like cannabis thistle, that you can, uh, you can dig them forever. I had a person come to me at a conference, and she said, I have hoed cannabis thistle in my backyard for 11 years, and it's just as bad this year as the first year. Because all you're doing is you're getting the tops, and then you, with one plant you took out, created the six roots, created six plants, and then the six become 36. And it, it just never. So there's just some stuff that. Now, if you want to use it smaller, you can use black plastic and mulch and cover it for a couple years. Um, I had a client in New Glarus that had four and a half acres, and she wanted to use plastic. Uh, so I maybe not the right person. I said, I, we're, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars and three, four years to convert that from smooth brome and ragweed and, and uh, can of thistle, can of golden rod, uh, you know, your typical old field holdouts. Uh, I, the amount of plastic, and then every time an animal scratches it, the plants are going to come right up through that hole right away, and then you're going to start all over again in that spot. And I said, we'd have thousands of sandbags trying to hold it down, and then when we're all done, i got to clean all that up. And so she didn't want to use herbicides, but she finally, I, I gave her a price, and she's like, in four years, I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. And it's, it's a human effort it would require to do it on that scale. But if you have a smaller area, it works great. Um, when you say smaller area, um, like this size or smaller, I have, this yeah, this room or smaller. I, this is the big area the size of this room. There was um, a park in Fitchburg that we worked on where a, a well meaning group of volunteers probably decided they were going to smother with black plastic, get photo biodegraded into little tiny chips like this. And then, of course, all the same noxious weeds were still there, only worse. And that now there's sandbags everywhere, and there's plastic blown all over the, the tennis court fences. It was, it was a horrible mess. So, you know, it's got to be thought out like any project, right? We've got to get the right plastic, we've got to lay it down, we've got to hold it, and we've got to follow through. We can't decide, oh, everybody lost interest in that project, so we're just walking away and leaving all that plastic just to blow around. So, those are things. We use a lot of herbicides with our company. I, I will not apologize for that because the human time scale is they want it now, they want it assured, and they want a product at the end. And I can't make that happen by rototilling for six years. I, I can't give them it on the scale that they want. Which brings me, actually, I have one more slide. Let me, because it is instructive. Restoration scale, this, this brings us to this topic. Plant diversity found in nature is hard to replicate in an urban environment in a small, small scale. So when I went out and I, I started a nursery operation, so I built a huge 1,000 acre native seed farm. And my, one of my principal jobs when I first started with that endeavor was I had to find seed sources. So I went to DNR files and I looked through they're, they're state natural areas, and then I set sign up to get a permit, and I go out and I drive, 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 drive until it was perfectly right, and then go and collect it. But as I walk through big prairies, like if you know where a Volca prairie is, way out in the Wisconsin River west of here, it's 2,000 acres. There are patches of wild bergamot the size of this room, mm -hmm. right? Because of soil chemistry and moisture and just how it got started. And, what all the little things that come into play for that species, it said, this is the right soil for me and I can outcompete anybody else in this particular area. And I might keep moving out or I might have to shrink because somebody else is gonna like it better than I. That's the world of competition in plants. So then we try and take the Avoca scale where there are single plants that are quarter, quarter acre at a time that occupy this because they like this soil type and they're going to be better at growing here than anybody else, any other species. How do we bring that to an urban environment where our, our scale is totally different? And so we'll end up with someone's backyard that's solid bergamot. What happened? We put in 60 species. Bergamot liked your soil, and they won. And how, how do you manage for that? It's difficult because it's so hard to get prairies to work in the first place. If I can get it just that and not weeds, I'm happy. 
the fact that the diversity got plummeted is, uh, is hard to deal with. The library will close in 30 minutes. Yeah, we're going to be done by then. Um, <laughs> I, it's hard for me to go in and start spraying wild bergamot out because we want something else to grow there. And it's, it's a challenging. Um, some species spread underground through roots and stems. They more, may form single monocultures greater than the area of your entire yard. So I'm trying to think of the name of the plant, and I've, I've lost it again. I've learned it so many times. It's a non-native, I think it's in the carrot family. I, I encountered it recently again. It has real dark foliage. It's about this tall, and it just the whole, your whole yard. It has a couple different bishop something. Gal 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 yes, Gal thank Gal you. Gal it came to me. If you know that Definitely. plant, you know, yeah. boy, it's a tough one. Yeah. That's an example of some species will spread like that and the entire yards will be gone. Um, I don't have that handout. I ran out of time today. That was the Physosthesia kind of plants that are on that list. Can you email that to me later? I can. And okay. then they can, yeah. so and you can, can send it out to people who registered. And you can get me through email on my website, so it's like solutions at, I think it's solutions at fsr.com or something. I, I, um, if you go to my website, just do field tree restorations, cottage grove or something, and I'm sure my website will come up. Um, you can send it out too. And there's an email link on there, you can email me if you have a question or one of, one of these lists. I get frantic this time, you're over 14 hour days. And, so, um, I yeah. can't imagine why you're doing this right now. Like, yeah, this is, I, you should be doing this in December. I know. I'm too nice. <laughs> and I always think, oh, that's three months away. I'll have everything under control by then. And then just disasters occur every day. Look, you took me out of my garden hours early today. So you know, <laughs> if you want to do this again in the middle of winter, then Yeah, I'd love to do it in the middle of winter. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've seen for taking a lawn and going to the garden and just kind of And peel the sod off. And peel it, but yep. then instead of having to get rid of all of that, just flip it. Just flip it over and see if it will rot, compost yeah. and rot. I, I haven't done that. I've pulled, uh, like the one I did with Bill and Randy in my old neighborhood, we just side cut it and disposed of it. And we were left with pretty good black soil because we were in a low area already next to a culvert. Um, and we didn't have an especially bad weed problem because your, your best weed flushes are fresh, clean, green, wheat seed, exposed to sunlight. So if you rototill your garden and just left it, it would probably be solid weeds within three weeks. And especially if you let annuals drop their seed the fall before or that spring. Those are your best plants that are going to come the hardest and the fastest. Every year that goes by, fewer and fewer of them get broken down by bacteria or eaten by ants or whatever else. And, and so your weed population, seed bank, starts to decrease, but many weed seeds can last hundreds of years. I think I saw something recently that they found an Egyptian tomb or something, I don't know where I saw it, and the seeds were 3,000 some years old and they grew. Yep. This is unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, um, there was a researcher by the last name of Beal, B-E-A-L, I think it was Michigan State. This was eons ago when I was in college, and I was studying his work he had started burying jars to see how long the seeds could last, and he, had, he buried them upside down so that there was some gas exchange and so forth. And he started on burying them every year, and then it was like you know, enough jars that they were doing every five, and then they were all germinating, so then he was doing every 10, and then it was like, I better go to every 20, and then this another new generation had to take over his, but you're running out of jars. And they were absolutely mystified that they could be at 100, and, I think when I was in college, they were at 130 or 140 years, and most of the seeds were still germinating in those glass jars. They dumped out into more greenhouse. So weeds are unusually tenacious uh, weed seeds. So it's, it's, I had a client that really disappointed me um, because their background, they should have known. But we went in and she wanted to convert her backyard to native prairie and we sprayed it with glyphosate three times, and she refused to pay us because she said, every time I showed up, there were weeds. And there couldn't possibly be weeds if you had sprayed. And anybody who's done enough gardening knows that you can till a garden, and, and 10 days later, it's, it's got weeds in it. I killed off the weeds that were on top of the seeds. Yeah. I mean, it's that easy. Okay.
And we know you get, at some point you just don't argue with people. I, I, we had an idea of what, what, what all happened. I sent her all of our field notes, you know, different pens, different days, different different yeah, cursive writing. Just bringing different the people. leads, I mean. So her idea was that if I sprayed it even once, there'd never ever be a weed there ever again. <laughs> no, and no. anybody who's gardened <laughs> extensively knows that it's never the case. They're because they're blowing in all the time. Um, every time you till, you, you get a flash of sunlight that triggers them to germinate, even yes. ones that are buried very deep. Uh, I've seen projects where they, they've cleaned out ditches and things, and then instantly they clean two, two feet of soil off, and it's still green. Because you've got insects dragging, and, you know, and think that the seeds down deeper. Seeds that were buried years ago and, and have had dust, um, sedimentation on them for years and years and years. And so all that's possible. So it's, it's a, this is an endless fight always for us. Um, do you have a secret for Groundhog to detour them? Uh, mm -hmm. I live on a glacial drumming on East Washington Avenue near Gardner, near Gardner Bakery, if you know, by the airport in there. And they really like that the slope, and they like the fact that it was sandy, and they could, they could dig holes. I have a hard time killing animals just because they're not where I want them to be. So I live trapped them, which you're actually not supposed to do because they're considered a roam, and you're not supposed to roam around. But there's a whole moral problem in itself. So I moved them to a big natural area. I moved 13 one spring, and my garden was still wrecked, and my yard was still mowing down. So I tried stuffing rags full of ammonia down the holes. I tried backfilling with broken rock and brick and packing it with a packer. There, there is something about woodchucks, ground bugs, that once the smell of <coughs> one is in there, they just can't resist digging it all back out again. I tried filling, filling the holes with water, but you, you've dumped, you can't dump water in the beach, on the, on the beach, and it, it just disappears. And that's how my yard was. So I could run a hose for a half hour, hour in one of their holes. Well, no water ever came during the back I have doing that, but they're right next to my house foundation, so I, I can't, because yes. I'm like, am I going to be my own yeah, there's a crack in your wall, you yeah. create that. Yeah, yeah, those darn little things. They make burrows all right along the whole house foundation. So what do you have that's going to get rid of those? I would try and like trap them, I guess, and then try and backfill the holes and just try and discourage them. They moved so much clay. They brought up all the clay from all Deep the down. tunnels. I mean, they just wrecked my whole bed. In that how, old is your, how old is your house? 97. Oh, so it's, it's been, and how long have you had the ground squirrels? Well, that was one? last year's issue. I hadn't had those problems that close really? to the house until last year. They had usually been keeping themselves like close to the pool and then dropping yeah. themselves in it. I wish more of them would do that. Only two this year. So my mice problem started when they trenched a new cable of some sort to my house. We got rid of something and took on the side. I don't manage that at my house. And we it, had TDS come through, and they put in all new... Oh. So yeah. we were left with this gash in the yard, and they didn't restore it at all, and i overwhelmed, I can't sometimes do things I should, and that allowed a cavity, and that's where all the holes are all down that cavity, all the way to the electric. Oh. And then from there, they were able to start moving out into the yard. Yeah, that's so I was thinking, from, if, like they, I was thinking if you had a... Something disturbed them, though, and they, they came closer to the house, and boy, are they happy, and I'm not. And I, I was thinking if you had a newer house, there may be still some backfill cavities. You know, when they backfill clay chunks, you'll get cavities and they'll settle over time. That's how your driveway ends up sinking below your your uh, yeah. garage foundation. But um, 97, I would think it would have been yeah, naturally that's packed that's itself tight by now. So, because that, sometimes animals can sense there's cavities and stuff. So that's why the problem with the woodchuck the groundhog is I buried two feet, but they may be able to sense somehow that there's a cavity down there that they can reach again. And, you know, pre-made home, why wouldn't you try and use it? Yeah. So, I, I lived in the house for 20 some years, and I moved woodchucks for most of those years, and it, it never ended. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. Because I'm a gardener, and I, they would crawl the six-foot fences, and they, again, they'd get in, and I'd see them, and they'd eat a third of each of my heads. I had these beautiful heads of lettuce, and they eat a third of each one. I, I, I didn't have, I, I didn't really want to eat it. I, I don't no. know what they touched. The one. Hair fell <laughs> off, and little mites and lice or whatever jumping off. Their little feet have been all over the place. 
for that to mulch them. Just throw them in a compost pile. After, you know, tending them for two for weeks. Three months. Yeah. yeah. The beautiful head of lettuce. I'm like, oh, I won't have to buy a dollar sixty-nine head of lettuce this week. And then they're all gone. It's frustrating. And that's another urban challenge. You know, all the way out in the country, there'd be foxes and coyotes and the farther north wolves and other bobcats and things that would control those. But the urban environment, it's harder. I think there's just more places they can hide and get away from. Uh, more skittish predators. So if you have any other questions or you want uh, a, a certain question, if I have a list of something pre-made from another, I've got 10 more PowerPoints if you want to be here until 3 in the morning. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's go. No. <laughs> Lake shore restoration, <laughs> vegetation management, I've done a bunch. Um, but just email me and I'll try and send you a list or answer the question via email. Thank you. It might not be that, that week or that night, but uh, eventually. Or you may have to remind me to. Because I, I get 40 a day, so sometimes things get way down on the list in a hurry. Yes, I will send out information after. Well, I guess it's tomorrow-ish. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you.